So um, thank you for inviting such an outlier to this amazing conference. I have learned so much. Um, I'm a food web ecologist who thinks about these sorts of things in some of the most changing environments on Earth, river networks. They change dramatically as you go from headwaters to main stems and over time. And my title suggests my interest, to put it mildly, in what happens when new traits are synthesized in nature and get introduced or driven into these more natural populations. So I try to teach ecology um, I, I keep a, a very complex system straight for students and myself by saying, well, what happens, for example, to those new organisms is that they'll interact with their environments and, have, and, be, and their performance will be affected by the environment that's the definition of ecology in a simple way, but these interactions are almost never direct. They're almost, they're almost all. Can I take this? Back? I guess I can't. There's no way to be public. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> they're almost always mediated through complex webs and. Uh, then the environment's going to change in an increasing way. This is my um, answer to Steve's Nike footprint on the earth. This is a cartoon depiction of what happens when we, it gets around to the point where we have to engineer the climate. And then, of course, there's what you're seeing at the conference about the tsunami that's going to overwhelm life with these genetic innovations that are um, exciting and terrifying. So. This is homage to Jennifer Doudna's opening of her book, A Crack in Creation, where she talks about the tsunami that she realizes is being unleashed on the nature of life. So dealing with complexity is nothing unique to ecology. I've learned so much at this conference and other places about how you take a genotype and then understand the hugely complex webs that affect regulation and expression of the phenotype. So it's a, so impressive what you've done. We are trying to use very similar approaches. And the logic actually is not too different at the two different scales. So you have a gene that would code for galactosidase that Jacob and Minode were studying. And it's repressed, but then there's a repressor of a repressor, the inducer, the substrate, that will activate the gene. And this same inhibition through three levels is what explains a lot of food chains that keep the world green. So you have plants that are grazed by herbivores but protected by predators. So in these three level systems, these are, it's a green world. The similar logic between molecular genetics and ecology was pointed out by Sean Carroll in his book. And now this is the, these are the a, a movie and a prime um, TV show that uh, Heather mentioned. So that three-level food chain actually does seem to be powerful in a lot of nature, and it's something that produces unexpected results when we manipulate predators or when they disappear for other reasons. So I think Jim Estes' sea otters that protect kelp forests from grazing urchins is quite famous. Um, Bob Payne was the person who inspired a lot of this logic by throwing starfish off the intertidal. This logic works in lakes and rivers. This is some of my work from Oklahoma, where if bass are present, the pool is filled with green algae. If they're absent, minnows graze it down to a barren state. So that seems simple and maybe reason for hope that we could repair nature by putting predators back, for example, but of course it isn't that simple. First, the green world hypothesis was devised by ecologists in Michigan, but Fretwell was working in Kansas and the world didn't look green to him. So he was thinking, what happens if you have fewer or more than three trophic levels? You might have a green world and defined here as the plants grow up to the point where they're resource limited. Then if you only have grazers in a two level chain, it's barren, add the predators, you get that green world back. But there are diseases or predators of predators that can make the world barren again. So we have this variable chain of regulation length that I know you deal with too, and hard to know in advance what it's going to be. 
And then also, we don't have chains in reality. We have webs. There are alternate pathways. There is anti-branching in your systems and ours. Also, interactions change with context. I appreciated very much Zach's point about the changing world. So there really are no field guides to the strong interactors. Some are more consistent than others, but they change with temporal and spatial context. So that's what the rest of the talk will emphasize, that here are rivers of Northern California. The Eel River is the third largest river in the state where I've done a lot of this work. And here's a cartoon of the food web. I want you to pay particular attention to the algae, the algae at the base of the food web, which provide most of the energy to the food webs that I've studied in clear flowing rivers. But that algae is composed of three categories of players. There are very nutritious diatoms, the good. They're somewhat toxic or potentially neurotoxic or liver toxic cyanobacteria. And both of them grow on plants, macroalgae, or on rocks. So what is river flow going to do? This is a picture I hope will intrigue you because you'll hear a lot more about this particular diatom shortly. So I want to emphasize flow variation. Big deal in California with our drought and our floods. And of course, a big deal for the coming world where these regimes are going to be intensified. So in California, we can have, you can think of us as having two kinds of winters, either wet winters in which you have one or more floods that are large enough to actually scour the entire mobilizable bed in rivers. It shakes the tablecloth, grinds up the attached biology, resets the food web. So that's a scouring flood winter. Or you can have winters that are so dry that that doesn't happen. You can have summers. We always have a summer drought in Mediterranean climate, but if there's adequate flow, normal flow, then the sunlit main stem reaches stay gently flushed. But in the multi-year drought, and for other reasons, we can get severely low flow, where those pools stagnate and get warm. So here's a picture of all of this. Um, summer drought, winter floods. Here's what happens after a scouring winter flood. You get huge proliferations of attached green algae, that structural clodophora. And it starts out clean over time. But I like to think of this as Rapunzel's green hair can get many meters long. But in her middle age, in late June, she turns into a blonde. And then in her later age, towards mid-July, she turns into a redhead. And this color change is due to increasing overgrowth by epiphytic diatoms. The blonde stage is kind of a monolayer with the diatoms attached directly to the host. By the time you get to the redheaded stage, it's a multi-layer, five to 10 cells deep over this poor smothered green host. And 95% of these cells, probably 95% of the biomass in this mid to late summer river is made up of a genus of diatom that's called epithemia. Epithemia is a diatom that contains endosymbiotic cyanobacteria from the lineage cyanotheci. The, this um, relationship is only 12 million years old because that's when the family of diatoms that has it differentiated from other diatoms. And these cyanobacteria can fix atmospheric nitrogen. So some cyanobacteria, when they fix nitrogen, make toxins out of it. But, cyanobacteria, cyan, but the cyanobacteria in epithemia make all 23 protein amino acids. And so this makes epithemia a superfood. The Japanese team sequenced it, found that they don't have photosystem 1 or 2. That was suspected earlier. And they fix atmospheric nitrogen. They make these all 23 protein as, amino acids. Then the diatom on its own gives you polyunsaturated fatty acids, which animals need and can't make and beta carotene, lots of general lipids. So it's genuinely a superfood. All of the grazers, tadpoles, mayflies, snails, um, everything swarms to epithemia, eats it, and bug production is 25-fold greater on epithemia than on other diets available in the river. So it's hugely ecologically important. And despite that, it's very, very prolific. 
under certain flow conditions. So Jane Marks was a student who's now become a professor at Northern Arizona University, and she's bringing higher tech stuff into our study of epithemia by labeling atmospheric nitrogen and following that into the endosymbiont and then um, carbon into the diatom. And she's used nanosims to see, to follow this heavy nitrogen into the spheroid, then into the diatom, then into the matrix and into neighboring diatoms that don't fix nitrogen. So we're hoping to push this technology as far as we can into at least local consumers in food webs. So this is um, exciting to be able to trace these atoms through these interactions. And then this is where we'll also try our first CRISPR-Cas ever, which would be to knock out the nitrogen fixation, maybe knock out some other parts of the metabolism, and then look at this trade-off of how much does it cost the diatom to support the nitrogen fixing endosymbiont because they have fewer when they're grown in nitrogen-rich rich media. So there's some interesting controls going on. So quickly, to go back to the macro world, you have a scouring flood. This is silt that's settled on, not much rock-bound biology. But then in June, you get Rapunzel's long hair. It gets overgrown, but then it starts to get wither back and get grazed before the onset of the next scouring floods the next winter. And there are infestations of bugs that actually live in the algae. This is a very important one. A little coronamin larvae that lives in Clodophora and makes itself a shelter, so, and then pokes its head out of the shelter, the tuft, and grazes the epithemia, but fragments the Clodophora enough that it reduces it. However, it's not obvious when you see this coincidence whether the midges are increasing and then decreasing. Are they just entrained to their food, or are they causing the collapse? So it was a top-down experiment that gave us the answer to that. What are fish doing? So this is our experimental scale for knocking in or knocking out fish. And uh, surprisingly dramatic results. When we, re when we took fish and enclosed them at slightly higher than field densities, the algae collapsed back within five weeks. It had started out 60, 80 centimeters long, and now in the six meter enclosure, it's nowhere more than one to two centimeters high, but it has this midge infested architecture. So here's a six centimeter minnow. Here's a falcon tube for scale. We use their sediment traps for us. So looking into the exclosure, no fish, you see these rusty colored globs, and then going underwater, you see the algae, the Clodophora is still erect, but it's turned a dingy color. That's overgrowth by diatoms, many epithemia. This is actually a three-level food chain. This is a nitrogen-fixing cyanobacteria, so is epithemia. Under these three-level conditions, the winners can fix the limiting resource, which is nitrogen. Well, I was really surprised that the midges did well in the presence of fish because I'd taken midges out, tied them up with cotton thread, deployed them at various places in the river to assess how predation intensity changed spatially, and fishes devour them immediately when they're exposed. But our fish don't recognize them in those tufts as prey. However, there are small predators that do. This is an insect larvae about an inch long. It becomes a damselfly, for those of you who know the biology. And it feeds by walking up to a tuft, studying it for seven or eight minutes, and then sending those mouth parts into the tuft, extracting the midge, and withdrawing it. And that's a flash, so you'd never see it. Nobody, even real naturalists, would probably not be zen enough to watch a midge tuft for seven or eight minutes. Or, but this is a case where the experimental result motivated the observation, interestingly. It's so often the other way. So we've got a three-level food chain um, if the fishes are removed, and that's a green world, but add those fishes, and they eat these small predators, releasing the midge, and the world turns barren. Interestingly, again, observation would mislead. If you looked at what the fish were eating, it's mostly herbivorous insects, but there's a key one with a predator-specific defense. So I think this kind of tricky complexity is very much what I've heard mirrored in your detective work as you work within the cells. Um, 
So this has been, this experiment is repeated for five years now, three flood years and a four level system for two of them when we had the midge and a three level system as you'd expect when the midge did not recruit in a given year. And then during drought, everything changes. So my next experiment as an assistant professor, I absolutely couldn't repeat my results. The fish had absolutely no effect on algae. And it turned out we had entered a drought year and the bed didn't scour. So two uh, orders of magnitude higher densities of these predator-resistant grazers grew up and ate the algae away before it even got started. So these were barren years. You get two kinds of slower growing grazers that dominate if there's no winter disturbance. The big armored caddisflies, those are about as big as a cigarette butt. And then also aquatic moths that live under silk tents. So both of these take a while to grow because of this defense, but when they do, they're the top of a two-level food chain. So I just I will sum this up um, later, but you get your longer food chains that grow salmon if you have a wet winter and a normal summer. If you have that dry winter, you get a food chain that will support some salmon growth, but a lot less because most of the algal productivity is getting diverted into those dicosmicas. Here's the third state that's extremely worrisome, and it's worse if you have a wet winter. You have wet winter, and then you have these extreme summer droughts. And so if you had a lot of winter rain, why do you have an extremely dry summer? Sometimes we have the extremely dry summer because we've had a four and a half year drought. But when that goes away, you can still have severe drawdown because marijuana is, requires 10 gallons per plant per day in July when the river needs the water the most also. So there's enough growth in the Emerald Triangle to dry up fairly large tributaries and main stems to a very, to, so with serious consequences. So what happens when that occurs? You have all this growth. If it, we had normal flow, it would be eaten or it would be shoved out to the estuary where it's devoured. Um, but the um, growth stagnates if you have these warm, low flow conditions and the temperatures rise to up into the high 30s. That's too hot for the diatoms. I hope you now have empathy for a diatom because this is what it would look like if it were happy. The carotenoids have gone, it's bleeding its chlorophyll into a matrix. Whatever nutrients are escaping are taken up by these little yarn balls which are coiled up strands of anabina, a potentially neurotoxic cyanobacteria. So anabina grows, proliferates, and then spreads in a variety of interesting ways, but in this case, vegetatively. So here's a river channel where the foreground has the healthy, rusty red algae. It's turning black because it's getting overgrown with anabina here. Let me show you what this looks like underwater. These were filamentous growths that are now smothered with a blanket of, of anabina, and here, you can see what's really going on. This is attached, this was attached to the substrate. It's the rusty red algae. But up here, an anabina growth has smothered the algae, is probably, I think of this, as feeding like a starfish. It's digesting it. It's taking up those nutrients and, and its mucousy mat is filled with the happy bubbles of extreme photosynthesis. <laughs> so those eventually pop it off the substrate and it drifts downstream to accumulate in river margins where dogs go and frolic in the river and then come back through this, lick their fur, and die in convulsions within 20 or 30 minutes. So this is what we're seeing in the Russian and the Eel rivers. And uh, my graduate student, Keith Baumagregson, has led us in a lot of outreach. And we train citizens about how to recognize the algae they need to thank for growing fish and the algae they need to be concerned about. So just to sum up, wet winter salmon state, dry winter dicosmica state, dry summer potentially cyanobacterial state. So I want to just, um, two more slides. I want to just end by saying how excited I am as an ecologist to hear the kinds of science you do because to me it sounds like your technology is letting you do natural history and ecology inside the living cell. 
that gives me goosebumps. I literally have them now. I mean, that's wonderful. And we have tools that some some of which you've provided. Um, others, you know, quantitative stable isotope probing is going to be very powerful for us too, and this visualization techniques. But so we can follow atoms and genes and molecules in open environments and see how they interact and then over scales that are going to reach up eventually and touch food web scales. So we're thinking in the same way and actually it makes you wonder if we're really as separate disciplines as we historically have seemed to be. Um, I think Tansley, who gave us the concept of ecosystems, recognized this when he said, these ecosystems, as we may call them, are of the most various so kinds and sizes, ranging from atoms to the universe. So this is a little bit too inclusive, perhaps. But, but certainly, from, from um, atoms and, and molecules in cells to the biosphere, the systems we isolate mentally for study are not only included as part of the larger ones, they are actually overlapping, interlocking, and interacting with each other. So if I wanted to understand what is the Eel River or other coastal rivers, what are they exporting to the ocean? This is NASA imagery of chlorophyll blooms. The red spots are either because of San Francisco Bay or because of the mouth of the Eel River. So hot spots of chlorophyll. Are we delivering nutritious diatoms or are we delivering cyanotoxins? So that would depend on what the algae are doing but how much algal production and what type depends on what the substrates are doing. Are they proliferating? Are they grazed back? That depends on the food web. How the food web sets up depends on the wet or dry hydrology and on where it sets up in this river network. So you have these nested networks in which this is the interaction we're interested in for the question about what's getting to the coastal ocean, but you can't understand it without going through all the higher levels of organization. So I hope you geneticists will keep the natural environment and the ability of ecologists to at least grasp what you're doing, even though we're slower because the scales are larger, but to at least grasp and definitely appreciate what you're doing as we cope with the changes that are coming to the world. Thank you. <laughs>